I'm happy for you to take over. Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming through to QFFF. Tonight, we are talking arts and social justice. My name is Nadine, and I'm here with a few amazing artists. So I'm going to ask you just to all introduce yourselves, kind of say what you do and what keeps you creating. So I'll, I'm going to pass the last up. Okay. Uh, can you start? I can start. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Sisetu. Uh, surname August. I come from Kailija. I'm with my friend now, so we are duo. We're doing music. Um, we, we do. We we also coming from a black lesbian organization called Free Gender. So yeah, we formed our group. Uh, when was it? 2016. Yeah. So. I'm also a filmmaker, so tomorrow I'll be screening my female, my film for the first time, and Nadine is my mentor. Do you want to say something? Oh, hi, hi everyone. Um, I go by the name um, I'm from a crew called LMS. It stands for Lesbians Never Surrender. I'm an activist as well. So, yeah, that's that's it for now. <laughs> hey, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Wewe Ngidi. Um, originally from Durban, um, based in Cape Town, um, a queer, black, feminist uh, activist and artist. I'm also a street photographer and my work focuses mostly on the marginalized group in South Africa, the oppressed and uh, yeah, the marginalized group. Hello everybody. Um, so I go by Kabil, which is um, a nuanced self-constructed identity. Um, my name is Mikhail. I'm a second year fine arts student um, interested in like multimedia performance, sculpture. Um, and like a lot of my work stems from my body and myself um, and my relation to space, people and groups. So yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Amy, can you just give an introduction to yourself, what you do? Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm Amy Brown. I am a word person, creative from the Cape Flats, and currently am filling the queer quota in Cape Town underground hip hop, mm -hmm. <laughs> formally and informally, you know, just always trying to create bridges, but also break uh, barriers. Okay, thanks for having me. Thanks, Amy. And Mia, if you could tell us about what you, what you do. So, hi, everyone. Um, good evening. And I'm Mia Adern. I'm a writer and a novelist. I also do freelance columns. Um, and I'm based in Cape Town. That's pretty much it. Nice. Uh, anyone have like, questions for each other at this stage? Mm -hmm. not, not no, okay. Cool. You know, um, we were speaking in the car about the work that you do and the portraits that you do, right? And I was just wondering about self-representation in our work and how challenging that can be and if you can kick us off. Uh, yes, so uh, the work that we were speaking about, uh, it's cycled and I am and I a woman. It's mostly my own self-portraits of myself. And the aim of uh, doing that work is self-love and uh, accepting who I am. And also because of all the challenges that we face as a queer group, and also the fact that there's also GPV uh, violence uh, amongst or against uh, women in this country. I must say it is quite not an easy thing to do, uh, doing a self-portrait. But um, so you do hope because uh, when you create art, you, you create because you are feeling some type of way and you want to either educate or show how you feel. And uh, unfortunately, that's not always the case from the viewer sometimes. That's what makes it a little bit uh, challenging. But yeah, so what I'm trying to do with that work is to show how uh, we are not always what the world or what the universe ex expects us to be, especially as, as queer women. 
where women in general are supposed to be uh, feminine, but then I'm, I'm portraying the actual opposite of that we can be whoever we want to be. We don't have to be following a certain type of, no, of, of a norm or, or the ways that we were taught. So my, my work is actually to challenge exactly that, like we can be who we are and we have so much uh, willpower, how much powerful actually women are in the world if only they could in themselves find the power and then they would uh, be able to relate to it and make use of it in a, in a way that is probably would be more effective out there. Uh, we can make people aware of our own power, which I think uh, it's also a little bit of a challenge for most uh, women. Uh, I see or find them looking for gaps or trying to find uh, in certain spaces that they, they feel within themselves. But once you're so content with yourself, you do not have those type of gaps. So I'm trying to reach out to women as well to really find who they are and stand on the ground who they are because you can, you can go a long way. Once you've healed with who you are or accepted who you are, it's so easy to take the next step. Mm -hmm. which I think most of us as women species, we fear that a lot, only because we've been told, oh, this we can't do, this is not for women, this is supposed to be done by a certain way or a certain person. But we actually, I think we're much more wiser than mm -hmm. anything else. We just have to find that ground. And you know, your work is also very much like you put yourself into the yeah. work and if you could just touch on that and the process that you go through and the challenges of that. Um, so I mentioned that uh, like the bill, um, excuse me? Nadine, I'm wondering if the bill wants us to play their work first before they, they share okay. a little bit about their work. Okay. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, about it and then we can watch it. Um, so portrait and like working with myself is, is been a very interesting form of introspection. Um, so the film that we are about to um, watch is called Atomic Pink. Um, and it's merely the name of the character more than the film. Um, and I've been experimenting with introspection on the level of um, looking at yourself as a character and this long history of characterization as queer people. Um, I was basically investigating and playing with myself and playing with this idea of identity and like how identity is actually performative within spaces. Um, and like being aware of your own performance or being aware of of your audience as, as an interesting play. And like Atomic Pink is basically addressing an audience that is unwanted. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, we can play that now.
So at the time of creating, um, I was still at school um, and there was two like ideas or like notions that I was playing with or like that I've been stuck with during this time. Um, and one of it was this idea of nudity and nakedness being attached to like slavery. Um, in this course that I was doing, I came across um, this guy called Kenneth Clark that said nakedness implies shame and like um, being like deprived of dignity. Um, and at the time I was playing with nakedness and what does nude mean? So like this idea of nude is um, well accepted. It's, it's, um, it's received well and it's understood in a context. Um, so what I was playing with is basically um, those blurring between those lines and this idea of anonymity. Like a lot of queer people and myself go through this experience of um, wanting to be anonymous or like our sexuality is supposed to be anonymous. Um, and this film or this clip or performance basically ties together all of that. This idea of nakedness, this idea of who's watching um, and this idea of agency also. Um, and part of like self-stylizing, this was, this was um, my destination for this clip was um, Instagram. Um, and during lockdown, like Instagram became my own gallery space. Um, Instagram became a platform for style, self-stylizing um, and also like my own art app. Um, and I've also realized that like Instagram has become individual archives for people, for, for queer people, for artists. Um, and it's a way of like building an archive and getting into action and also seeing how people respond to it, um, which is not necessarily always a safe space. Um, but this part of this film was like laying myself game, putting myself out there and like, so now you can judge me. So mm. it's basically like, yes, I enjoy being nude. Yes, I enjoy being naked. Um, yes, I enjoy um, being anonymous. But at this point, it's basically like, let's talk about it. What does it mean to you? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> I really like, for me also, um, when I saw like, the mask already says a lot, yeah. right? And there's so much to unpack just with that and then the color and all of it. Yeah. yeah. So the mask, um, in choosing the mask, it was very random. Um, because I started playing with this pink mask in the beginning of the year. And I've done photo books, I've done series of it. Um, and I've literally developed an entire character without me knowing. Um, and like every time I do wear this pink mask, um, the context of burglary or the context of violence is always like there, but then contrasted with this like pink palaclava and this naked body. Um, and then again, it's not naked, it's nude. So it's like this playing between accepted, what's accepted and what's not accepted um, and negative and like what's positive. Um, and so like the pink balaclava is basically atomic pink. Um, yeah. So Alan is, you guys, I mean, take us through your writing process. What, what is the content of your lyrics? And also just picking up, is there a difference between then your writing process and when you perform? Um, yeah, I think if you can take us through that. Okay, so, um, we, we have a song called uh, One Change. So when, when we wrote that song, we were like, um, okay, when we had that concept, we, we wanted to like um, show the community that we're here and we're telling them that we want change. We keep on being those people that we are because they have a tendency of saying that it's just a phase. And mm -hmm. so um, by that song, we saying that we're here, we're not changing and we're going nowhere. So I believe that um, most of our songs, um, they're inspired by the work that we're doing. We like, um, we activists. So yeah. And, and also coming from the townships, Ikasi, and what we go through as black lesbians, and this is where we face um, the reality, what is going on, what we face discrimination, hate crime, 
you know, when we, when we write music, we try by all means to make everyone that is going through through same struggles that we go through and every day in townships. We send that we try by all means to send a message through our music. This is our only tool that we can like fight the whole for being. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Can we ask you for a for a stanza? Yeah. <laughs> Just a few lines. Yeah, just a few lines, few lines. Few lines so guys. I was just gonna quote on what I wrote on one change. Um, okay, I repeat to our brothers and sisters, how can we kill Ben and rape a human for being who they really are? Um, it's not it's, it's life, it's not life that is so unfair, it's people. This home of they're busy judging, hating, they don't know nothing about us, they don't know the struggle we go through each and every day. It's even scared to walk on the street alone because we're the main target. I repeat once again to our brothers and sisters. We still yeah, we're free, but I'll never even say that we're free. Mm. It's a go. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, kept free as a kid. I never noticed. I wasn't happy so playing with any kid or the change. Suddenly when we all knew about the real me. Yes, I was being proud. They started calling me names. Because many stories were created and they believed them. Distancing themselves from me, we all human rights. We are all human right. We all make sins. Let God be the judge. They call me names because I'm in love with her. And I think it's got a scene because he's in love with him, not her. It's cool. Yeah. 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 Amy, do you want to share with us how your art um, gives expression to your activism? Uh, Amy. Amy, did you hear me? Yes, yes. How my art, how my art gives um, expression to my activism. Mm. Um, I feel like, I feel like just like um, they were saying, like this performative nature to being an artist already. There's already so much uh, performance that comes into it. So, just the choice to just be authentically myself, I think, is already an act of activism. But you know, activism as in like realism, not really acting. The you know being being the wisdom you know like existing and and you know as queer bodies our our choice to create and our choice to be is in itself a statement you know is in itself a a, a middle finger against everything we're not supposed to be doing um, especially now that I'm I'm a part of like hip hop so generally not a safe space for feminine bodies never mind queer bodies. And I think sometimes it's the choice to put myself in uncomfortable spaces or spaces where I wouldn't technically be welcomed is is like that kind of subtle form of, of activism, which I think to me is the realist. Um, and also like the, the easiest that I can do with my capacity as one person. You know, I can't take on everything, but I do feel like we as creators, particularly queer, do get to be the voice for, you know, ourselves via other people and other people via ourselves. Thanks, Amy. Amir, how, um, maybe we can talk about like, how do we distribute work? How do we get our work, our voices out there? How do you do it? Um, so I think one of the first things about that is to, is to know what your voice is and not to compromise on it, um, to, to try and be like quite true and quite unapologetic in, in what your voice is because you're going to encounter some opposition to that. Um, so I think, you know, the, the way I do it is to kind of, you know, alleviate self-doubt um, and, and just and stick to what you're saying um, in terms of getting it out there. It's, it's what we're doing right now. It's finding like-minded people. It's community. Um, and, you know, couching your voice in people who believe what you believe, I think is very important, very helpful, also very healing. Um, so I think, yeah, it's surrounding yourself with those kinds of circles and not doubting what you know, you know, um, and then just speaking while trying to be as safe as possible. And again, community comes into, into play there in a big way. Okay. Wait, wait, what do you think? What's the marriage? Like, let's call it marriage or whatever between art and activism. How do you see that? Is it something that's natural? Or is it something that you have to really work at? Okay, um, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think if you are an artist, there, there must be some sort of activism in that art because for you to become an artist, you are going to try and have a subject and that's already on its own activism or 
because activism is always got to do with educating or aiming to teach or aiming to demolish sometimes or to burn or or to bring awareness one of those things so i, I think it it does go very well as a very good married couple <laughs> and you cannot do without the one um i mean if i'm thinking of it um in the eight, early 90s i went to the gay game the first gay games in amsterdam mm -hmm. i mean i would have never thought there was activism in its own but mm -hmm. it was because during those days there were very little people that were even coming out in the world as as uh, gay people at all let alone going to such an event which was quite something huge i mean at that time when i did it it was like okay i'm going to the gay games but then when i was there it became something really special then i realized how special it is to actually attend such a biggest event in the whole world and also because it was one of the first gay games ever mm -hmm. that they ever did in Amsterdam. And I got to travel outside of the country. But of course, there was a gay activism on its own. I went there to perform. Uh, that time I was still doing theatre. And uh, we were doing a play called Up the Nines. It was about um, gays and lesbian history stories that happened early in the 60s in South Africa where people were still called after nines because you only did it after nines. I mean, the world has uh, changed uh, there's so much. Uh, I've seen I've seen so much things and daring uh, from that time till now. Uh, those days, it was quite tough just to even come out. So a lot of people would do it in closed doors, hence after night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I think the two go. And you want to touch on that? <coughs> Can you please repeat the question? Um, like, what, how do you see the connection between arts and activism? Okay, for uh, for us, uh, I'll speak on behalf of LNS because when we had this idea, we were like, um, for us, we 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 were always like facing those pro those um challenges when we may be standing on the stage, some would be like, uh, we're trying to be men and all that. So by writing music, we were like trying to, to talk straight to those people. And then um, I believe that um, being an activist also taught us to never keep quiet when you see there's something that you want to change. So by our music, we, we still want to change those stereotype minds. So yeah, that's what I can say. And what is the reaction to your work been like? For now, we just released we just released an awesome song and it's making great on online. It's called uh, Start. It's it's called Start, but first line it's saying that Nick is a trash. So uh, people love it. And even Nick is at studio, they're vibing on it. But when they start hearing Nick is trash, but they keep vibing on it on the song. <laughs> it's, a, it's an awesome song. So yeah, we're shooting it uh, on the five. And still, our niggas want to be on that music video <laughs> because they love they love the song, even though we call them trash, but they still <laughs> yeah. jamming to it. So on that song, we're trying to you see on that song, um, we're just telling them that uh, we don't most they have that mindset of saying that. Uh, we take their girls, we don't take their girls, we just are uh, like focusing on us. Yeah, we wash and we clean. We sing on that song, <laughs> we wash and then we clean, <laughs> and then we, clean, <laughs> and then and then we just fun. and we tell them straight if you mess with her, <laughs> girls, <laughs> take losses. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of like a vibe song if you would listen to it. So, it's an awesome, it's song. an awesome it's start, LNS. Just go look for it on SoundCloud, it's there. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Um, Mia, do you maybe want to tell us about like the, the biggest struggles or barriers you faced in creating work? Sure. Um, yeah, so I've just published my first novel. Um, it was a, it was a big struggle to get it out there in the first place, just getting a book published. I received like lots and lots of rejection um, emails and letters, so you know. I kind of just pushed through. I also received feedback to change the way that I wrote it um, from various people, which I didn't take on. 
Um, so I think you, yeah, there's definitely, I had to develop a, a bit of a thicker skin and just carry on writing and improving um, without, without compromising, um, you know, my own voice too much. Um, and I, yeah, I just remained kind of committed to, to a style. And so, yeah, so eventually, you know, it's out now. Other, other struggles I had was, you know, like, do I want to expose what I'm actually exposing here in this book, you know, because some of it drew on my own experience, which I hadn't really spoken out about in my own life. It was then, okay, well, shit, this is now going to be in the public domain. My family is going to read it. My friends are going to read it. Um, and that was fucking terrifying. So, you know, that was just an internal struggle that, that I had as well in writing it. So, you know, there's both those external struggles of, you know, how do I get myself on this platform? And in the internal struggle of like, do I, how do I feel about like bearing myself in this way? Um, and I think both of them were, 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 were hard, but also like quite rewarding. Tell us a bit about the content title of this new work. Sure, so it's called um, Mermaid Fillet or Mermaid Fillet, depending on how you want to say it. Um, and yeah, it's about smuggling mermaid tales on the black market. So it's magic realism. Uh, it's, it's kind of set in this, in this fantasy world and there's a goddess who rules over the world of the characters. And every time there's an act of sexual violence, um, the goddess rains down a menstrual bloodstorm. And so if it's, a, if it's like a really hectic act of sexual violence, that bloodstorm can kill a character. It can kill an aggressor or predator. If it's a slightly less um, aggressive act of sexual violence, it'll be like a light drizzle just to let you know, you know, that, that the worst is coming. And so that's one of the devices that um, I played with in it. So what, what inspired that? I think, you know, I want to see revenge on, on purpose. And so I wanted a, a device, a goddess character who could do that. There's one character, Letitia, who, who's, um, whose sexual predator dies. You know, she gets assaulted very young and he then dies and she can't ever exact vengeance. And so I think what inspired a, a, a goddess that can, can kill kind of rapists, pedophiles, um, microaggressions as well, we can punish just the spectrum was something that I needed. I needed to envision a figure that could do that, you know, um, when we can't always get that vengeance and can't always exact that violence. So I think I had a need for violence in myself that, um, you know, I just managed to get out there with this goddess character. Yeah, I find that really interesting because I'm also in my own work toying around with fantasy characters because I think like, the activist work doesn't, it's activism and realism and all of that, but there's something that can be done with, fan, the, with the fantastic, you mm. know, that I find, yeah, mm. so, so fascinating actually. Even right now, I'm, I'm also like toying around with like vampires, vampires of color, you know, like, and because you can mold that in certain ways that, so this, Goddess um, idea and the reigning of menstrual blood, yo, know, that is really fascinating mm. to me. Yeah, yeah. That's really fascinating. Wow. Wow. And I think like Amy, if you can pick up there, really, like just um, putting yourself out there takes a lot, right? And wh what barriers and struggles do you face with that number one? And yeah, just overcoming it and reactions to your work. And not, and not maybe not even reactions to your work, but reactions to you, right? Because you you out there, you breaking those, breaking many barriers. How have people been reacting? I mean, I think it's so important what Mia was noting about how we sometimes are from the inside our own sometimes barriers of access. So obviously, with that being said, just like I mean, being people of being a person of color, being a queer body, being a feminine body. Um, already comes with its own kind of sometimes predisposed angst, you know. So working through that has, has taken me to, to content, but also don't want to be lost in that. Don't want to also just give too much. So I would definitely say that the barriers have been obviously myself and then maybe just realizing that within a certain realm, within a certain sphere, they are like kind of boxes that you have to opt in and out of in as much as you don't want to be in any box. There are certainly boxes 
that even if it's just for publishing or even if it's just for submissions to festivals, whatever. So there, there are still parameters on, on your creative expression. So finding a way to finesse that, balance it, while trying to, you know, actually maintain art that you can eat from has been has been something that's been um, sometimes problematic. And also knowing that support of artists have also become an entire industry, the industry of, you know, supporting artists. So sometimes non-art people or non-creatives curating and moderating spaces with creatives are there and often finding themselves taking advantage of. So there's definitely been some, been some of that. Um, responses to me have been, I want to say twofold. I mean, my initial introduction to Cape Town Hip Hop was through Battle Rap. So as you can imagine, that comes with its own level of already toxicity. And then all of my peers were male bodies. So there was all of those kind of nuances and um, found myself almost sometimes pining to the to the mainstream, whether it comes to pining to what the feminine aesthetic should or shouldn't be and feeling like I had to pick a side, you either one side of the, of the feminine expression or another side. So you either super woke, pardon my use of the word woke, but either super woke or you're super naked. And you know, like in terms of that's your limitation as a female expressor, that's what you get. And also realizing that that in itself is a negative thing because I am everything. So choosing to opt into like, like nudity, like you were saying, for example, choosing that and then choosing to still have an expression that is really a vibration that I feel is healing. And at the same time, having talking about niggas being trash, you know, like allowing yourself to flow through the many parts of yourself. And hopefully the people who appreciate your art evolve along with you and evolve along your journey. And we all going to be those people who don't because they have an expectation of you and somehow your art has to represent them or go in line with the idea that they have of you. So I think letting go of that and um, noting that with that realness, the, the responses have just been more more real. And when you understand what it is you're putting out, you can start to attract things that are more in line with how you see yourself, I think. Can you give us, I mean, you don't need to split, but can you give us an idea of your content? An idea of my content? Yeah. Okay, my content is so vast, my content is so vast, but the first thing that comes to my head, I'll split for you. Okay. Okay. Um, they take for me, they see my waves a bit straight in time, and they were to mate, as a cake Malay. This place from the place where almost safety and safety, they pain away. They see the grain from my ancestors. They see in the grain from my ancestors, lege rape the slaves. Na die tijd vir die skates voorbij, daar is nou dinge wat vee verspreid jou die buits en claims en die verstaan nie misverstaan. Het die begin giste man, toe die ander miste van die different land, hier beland en an en an nou hier beplan, nou klap ek een ander man sy magge tang. Ja! That was hot. Yeah, yeah, you got it, you got it. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. And I think also, if I can ask, like, um, you know, the, I often think about, um, like, the filmmaker Ava DuVernay, like, she says, sometimes you can't really rely on a film to change the world, but what, but what a film and art can do is change association with words, mm. right? Mm. So now, for example, she made the film 13. So when people hear the word convict, they should think differently about that word. And I was wondering, you know, with your art, how do you, how do you see that? You know, can it change the world? Can you change, change associations with certain words? Like, what are you, what are you playing with there? I mean, I think, I think the, and I was having a conversation with a, a fellow creative of mine saying that like how the words sometimes have a job, even the, within the LGBTI expression, you often find that the words, the academic words, become less important to the people living the words and more important to the people who need to understand why you choose to live those words, particularly. So then you find yourself as an actual, you find yourself describing yourself more than living. <laughs> and that's been, you know, and, and in the one to explain, you find yourself explaining yourself and then never taking enough time to just appreciate that you deserve to be a, uh, and, and you should, you know, and, and almost like rejecting yourself in a manner of like having to constantly 
validate why. But with that being said, I think that like, I think it's such a sensitive topic about the words, but I choose to believe that my intent with the words are always gonna be more important than the connotations that they have out there, you know? Um, I've often used uh, def defamatory words towards queer people in my expression of myself, having been called these things, with the, with the hope that I get to heal myself through it, you know? Because at the, at, the, at the end of it, I can't really expect to express myself clearly to other people if I haven't accepted myself, if I haven't healed from the, definitely the trauma that allows me to create, but won't allow me to continue to navigate, you know? So definitely redeciding the words, but also not being satisfied with like fancy, for example. So I'm often being called a fancy as, you know, as a somehow separating from a man who runs words together. So sometimes in with these in these nuances of, of, of navigating, people are satisfied with being called a, a feminine version of a, of a job description, but still getting paid less. Then mm. you know, in the masculine counterpart. So sometimes yeah. the words have their place, but sometimes the words are grossly misplaced. And so navigating those things for me has been super important. Mm. Mm. Alan, is you also work a lot with words? And what are like some of the connotations you hope to change? You know, the power of words. Um, okay. Okay, so, and um, for an artist, um, like, you know, when you're, when you're a rapper, a female, when you stand, just when you stand on that, on that stage, they expect you to sing. I don't know what's that mindset. And sometimes when you're like in the studio, um, I had a friend of mine, she, 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 she's masculine, and she came to this uh, record label. She told me that she was like forced to change the way she looked so that she can decide. So she couldn't take that and she left it. So those are the like type of things that I would want to see change one day because you can change someone just for like, you can change someone. Your expectation. Yeah. yeah. So also the fact that they, when you're on stage, they expect a female to seeing and do all that because they sometimes um i don't know this they, they'd be surprised when like standing on stage and spitting the way they spit i mean men i'm talking about men so i would like to change that and the fact that um in our code we seen as we want to be men as wannabes we don't want to be men be women i mean we have boobs you know that shit because they language but yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, those are the kind of things that we would love to change. Also, when you're like, you, the fact that you can't walk freely with our girls on the hood. You know, when you're staying in the hood, there's always a gang of guys sitting next to a shop. Imagine you going to buy. And they're ready to attack. Yeah, always just, ready to attack. So those are the type of things that we would, I, I would like to change. And we'd like to normalize that. Yeah. There are people like us in the hood and we dare to stay. It's not just like a phase or something. Yeah. No, we won't ever, ever change. It's who we are. So that's the thing that we would like to, we'd like to change, you know? Yeah, yeah, also our parents with our parents. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can touch on that and audiences, how do we reach audiences? How do we work with our audiences? Who are our audiences? <laughs> yes, yeah. okay. Um, an audience is very hard to, to, to choose. Yes. However, um, I... I just believe that uh, messaging is what helps to, mm. to, to, to get the people coming in uh, in connection with your work. So sometimes if your messaging is correct, it's going to touch a certain type of people and you know those people will come. So me as a photographer, uh, I don't really use a lot of words, which, is, uh, uh, which I do quite enjoy because then I don't have to write, I just express. But uh, when I show my work on uh, Instagram, I know most of the people that are gonna look at it, are obviously photographers first. Yes, there's gonna be 
uh, some friends who are going to look at it just because they know that's the type of work I do. But obviously now I know most of my audience will be coming from that same uh, medium, mm -hmm. which would be pictures. And then it ends up being just artists because now at the end of the day, it's still art. So they would look at it because it is art. But to just get any ordinary person to view, it is uh, rather a bit harsh, uh, difficult. But what I think will help is to just post the same thing in over again. People will then think, OK, I've seen this last week. And check it. let me just check. What is this about? Then, of course, you touch someone else who's not really an artist. Uh, but I also believe that uh, dialogues help a lot mm -hmm. to to get a uh, certain audience, depending who you want to reach or which type of audience you're actually looking to reach is the most important thing. Because now you have to make sure you decide first who wants, who, who needs to see this, and uh, you can then work more on dialogue and then obviously show your work. I mean, I was just listening to what they, they were saying and they said they, were, they would like to change uh, how they are seen in the location. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just, just to say that I'm like 47 years old, that's been my dream <laughs> for, for as long as I've lived, because I also grew up in that type of environment. and. But the look of things change is very hard to, to come. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been trying to educate people about lesbians those days. I mean, the umbrella wasn't as big as it is now. They were just gays and lesbians. And being bisexual was such a taboo in those days. But mm -hmm. now there's so much, so much layer. And I just think we keep educating and educating and educating. So I'm not even sure. Like, ways our audience because now mm. we've been educating for as, as far as I can remember as far as there was civilization mm. educating mm. <laughs> and they still yeah. do not get yeah. that we are going anyway yeah. so uh, I don't know maybe we need to change our audience <laughs> depending who's our audience right yeah, yeah. and you also mentioned Kabul that you posted a lot of things on Instagram I mean is that the way forward then um Ironically, like Instagram for the past probably five years has become an unconventional gallery space. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to what Amy mentioned about this idea of um, words and labels that, that we create through knowledge and then yet we don't know how to apply or identify them in reality. The same with like art, this idea of art has been like so theorized that when we can't really identify it or like this is art. Um, and like, I've always had this placing thing where I've, I've told literally everybody in my life, like I want my art outside of a gallery. I want my art out, or not on a wall. Like I don't want my art to be amongst the art wall. Like I want my art like towards the public, towards the people that are in the wood, towards the people that are in the ghetto. Um, and like, throwing back to this idea of art and, and activism mm -hmm. and like where they meet. Mm -hmm. Like me and you and Zina have also like, since then we joined and like this idea of artivists um, is basically in that also choosing this audience. Um, and like, I feel like that's almost the third party to, to art, activism and audience. It's like, who are you projecting this to? Who are you informing? Who are you educating? Yeah. Um, and as a creative, like I also feel that I'm an activist in what I create because like my creation is solely based of like social ills and like trying to have social justice or trying to um, promote or advocate something. Um, and I think all of us on this panel and everybody that is a creative that find themselves in like activism as well. They, they use like creative methods of communicating. Um, so I feel like they, they very like, they very close. And I always find it funny that we like separate them. Mm -hmm. Like we tend to separate them a lot. Um, and it's basically also the audience. So like the idea of like activism is towards the public. 
artists towards the bourgeoisie or like mm -hmm. the people that can afford to go to a gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I mean, they've had enough educating in their life. So, yeah. Yeah. When Mia, do you have an input on that? Like, do you, do you write with a specific audience in mind or is it just you writing and you hope it falls on the right ears and eyes? What, what's your process? With, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I, I love that last comment. Um, it, accessibility is so important. Like art in museum spaces, in galleries is immediately, you know, inaccessible. And it's so important to try and get your, your art, even if it's, you know, not visual into a more accessible space. And I think social media does that in a really big way. So with reading as well, like, you know, I didn't grow up reading a lot of books written with caps in it, for example, you know, reading reading and, and writing has always had a particularly elitist um, vibe about it where you know, you know what kind of language you're going to be reading. And so I think it starts there with your, your choice of how, how to write, how to create, but then also the way you put it out. Like not everyone wants to read a book. So for me, I, I don't even want to read a book a lot of the time. I also want to, you know, listen to music, watch series. I mean, like, let's be honest. So um, when I put the work out there, I also used Instagram. I had character cards for all of my characters with the image of the, of the character. And then I also asked um, voiceover artists, people I know who, who had things in common with the characters to voice those characters online. So you can, as an audience, you now get a taste of each of these characters without having to open a book. Because we want, I think as, as, you know, as consumers of online content ourselves, we want to, to engage with that work in various ways. We don't just want one medium. So I think trying to expand your art into as many disciplines and as many mediums as, as possible that you know, also like also while staying true to you and the way you want to create it, but also in collaborative ways. Where I was like, this is this person who I know relates to my character in some kind of way. Um, let's get him to voice this, so let's get her to to voice that. And and in that way, you're also putting each other up. Um, and so I think yeah, it's all just about expanding and including as much as you can, so that it's not just confined to this artistic object. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um. Amy, do you create with a certain audience in mind? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've um, always kind of discussed with my, my friend as to why it is to do something. Because for me, like when I'm creating, I, I think most artists usually know what they want to do, where they want to do it, when, and all of those. But often the why, back to like the actual motivation, is like such a, you know, the, the finding of meaning is like part of the creative artist's journey. You know, applying meaning to things and uh, finding for me sense and sanity out of giving things meaning you know beyond what i've been told to think they mean um so but with that being said i have a very like i don't know very individual relationship with the audience because in as much as i in as much as it's almost like the the the, the super villain and the hero like you know they can't kind of exist without each other and that that kind of loop continues to happen so without the people appreciating my my creations i don't really get that, you know, doesn't quite go full circle. So when I'm creating, often I find myself creating for the moment where I get to share it and not really considering who I'm sharing it with. And in being a fluid creative, I often find myself having multiple forms of creation which can fit into particular spaces or kind of chameleon way of writing. So if I am in a space that's more geared to one sort of way, I'll be able to express myself without being misunderstood. You know, you don't always want to take gangster rap into a slam poetry space. I'm not saying they don't, they can't coexist, but I'm saying if you can. For me, I've taken pride in being able to be in many spaces. So for me, I would say I don't really think about who I am writing for and I really just think about why I'm sharing it. That mm -hmm. becomes the main thing. It's a, it's a very selfish process. I need to get the words out though, because if they don't, then I'm not quite, <laughs> not quite safe. Yeah, that's so powerful. And on that note, like, why do we see? Why do we see the way we do? Um, it's it's a very interesting question because, like, um, like me, I would have like this very personal book. Um, me that works with like identity and my body. Um, mm. and like I think creating and being a creator, 
you need to like be going through some shit. Mm. You need to be hurting in order to be creating. Um, and I think that is why we create. It's, it's, it's a form of self-therapy. It's a form of like understanding and working through your own stuff in a way that is not being taught to you, but a way that feels best towards you. So it doesn't need to be painting. It doesn't need to be drawing. It doesn't need to be writing. Um, I can take any shape or form. And I think um, in that way, we need to not box creation or like box our creativity. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think it goes, uh, I, I sort of do agree to the fact that you have to be going to do something to create something and then obviously because you've gone through something, you've created this, now you want to share this mm -hmm. and you want people who can relate mm -hmm. to either what you've been going through or maybe help someone uh, not go through what you've done. Mm -hmm. So you would share to either help uh, or to, you know. And uh, if I look at my work, because it's a collaboration of, of different things, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Cups and Clubs, uh, mm -hmm. I share that because I feel that most people in Cape Town, they're not really so in tune with their own culture. Mm -hmm. And I think the Gaps and Clubs is such a huge cultural thing there in Cape Town. And when I speak to people that are coming from here in Cape Town, they don't seem to know what the culture is here, you know. Uh, and then I look at that work and I think, but this has so much history in it. How could you not, not see this as a culture of your, your own uh, uh, suburb of Korea or city? And me as an outsider, that's what I looked at. And then I share the story because I come from that very same, uh, I grew up during the apartheid times. So even though my parents were not really slaves, but I related to when I actually saw the, the, par the parade, I was like, you know, actually we had been going through this cycle for so long. Virginia that time is still happening here. And then the fact that it happens here all the time, every year, and now it is even lost the meaning. It's just like now a show to entertain mm -hmm. the tourists that come here so that Cape Town can make uh, some sort of, uh, not Cape Town, where well, the government can make <laughs> money out of it. But then the biggest question is where does that money go when the actual people that do the cups and clubs are still find themselves in the very same space where they are. That's why they keep this uh, tradition going in to them. It has become like part of who they are, you know. And when they do it, they're not doing it to entertain actually the the, the foreigners that come into the country they do it because it's something they believe in. It has been like a survival mm -hmm. of their own culture from 20th, 19th century, you know? So yeah, but, mm -hmm. I, and, and when I look at them, them sharing it, you can feel like these people are inside this. You cannot take the cups and clubs out of it. It's who they are, mm -hmm. you know? And maybe that's why they do it. And that's why they spend so much just creating uh, their clothing and their umbrellas, their song, their music that they're gonna do, of which people don't even listen to their music. But if you sit and listen to their songs, the songs are very powerful. They have a very powerful message into what the actual Pops the Club says about, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, but we share because we want to educate and because we want to prevent something from affecting the next person. Or you, you, you share because people need to know also mm -hmm. what is happening in this world and how fucked up our countries <laughs> actually is. We yeah. need to share that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that is also a question, how is the community responding to your, to your work? Or what has been the most surprising response to your work? Um, as I haven't actually shown my work to a lot of spaces. I've had the opportunity to show some of it at the Zeitz Smoker, mm. but uh, because it's 
it's different series. So the one that I showed at the Zyde Smoker was about uh, nannies. So you know, the mothers who take care of other people's mothers, uh, children, because uh, they have to work and that's the type of the work they can get. But then it raises a lot of questions into what happens to the child that's left back home by that parent. And then again, what happens to the very same child that's being managed because that is not their mother. And some of them maybe don't even know, not that maybe they don't even know the language. So you find this woman speaking her own mother tongue to this wild child. And you, you'll be so amazed that mm -hmm. they do actually communicate, even though it's two different languages, but they, they find the ways to understand each other. But uh, I had a very good uh, response to that uh, because I suppose most of us here can relate to that time. Of, most of us have some sort of a story to tell in that way where it's either not your own mother, but it was an aunt that you know, it's always like grandmother, something that's also in our community. So maybe that's why they ha I had so much of response. I haven't had uh, much of response with the Capsa Club say, well, I know is uh, being prevented many times to get to the pictures because people want to know what I'm going to do with it, I'm going to sell it, or what is it for? And also I know there's a lot of uh, money scandals involved mm -hmm. into that thing. So some people think so we are, but I would love to actually show all of it if I was given an opportunity one day. But uh, all that is, we lack a lot of uh, resources, yeah. uh, especially in this country, to actually go away or take our art when we actually want it to go. Uh, yeah. And for Ellen, it's like what what kind of resources that. Um, does it take to run LMS? What do you need? And now, are you looking for funds? How do you deal with funds, resources, all of those things? Okay. Um, during, uh, also, I'll speak during, uh, during lockdown. During lockdown, we like, um, you know, when you're recording, you have to pay through your time and it costs, you have to buy beats and it costs. So during lockdown, we're like stuck, we're not working not getting gigs. So it was kind of like hard to, we had something to record, but we didn't have money to pay for those uh, studio time. So we came up with an idea of like washing sneakers and cutting her because we can cut her. So during lockdown, we've been doing that work and it has been like, our, our community has been like supporting us our friends, they were no longer cutting their hair in the barbers, they were coming straight to us. And and families were more scared of Corona, so we come to your house with sanitizer and our mask on and then we we'll cut your, their boys and they are still booking us even now. And then we believe that um, the country is almost like being open now, but um, yeah, we do have our small things that we're doing. So we're no longer like focusing straight on that business, but the community is like it's still attached to that. But yeah, we, we, we try, we try. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Mia, how has how has lockdown affected your work? Um, well, so my book was only released after lockdown, you know, after COVID came out, then it was, you know, it was, so there was no launch, you know, there was no physical launch. It was, everything was delayed in terms of orders, just logistically, it, it was, it was quite a thing, um, which isn't ideal, but at the same time, I've got some serious social anxiety. So the fact that I didn't have to go out and meet people and like, you know, interact with people physically, you know, in, 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 in regard to this work that is quite personal, mm -hmm. I think was, was also kind of nice. We was like, okay, well, there's a, there's a, a screen yet. I'm, I'm still kind of protected and insular. Um, I don't have to, I don't have to get my work out there like that. So in, it almost, I almost felt like a little protected by it. 
um, even though I know it's not the best thing for launches and for sales and whatever, but it was kind of a blessing and a curse in, in that sense. Um, and then creatively speaking, my process when I'm, when I'm writing is quite, um, is quite insular. Before I look at how to distribute work, I generally don't tell people what I'm doing. It's not something that like I do with, with other people. I, I think it's a kind of similar to, to what Amy was saying, where you kind of have to get those words out of you. And it's only you, it's you speaking to yourself during that process. So I also found like, you know, in that sense, it, it was okay. It, it was okay. And that's not to say that they weren't kind of mental health implications like you know being alone and isolated for for spans of time like that I think is didn't have the best effect um on my mental health and kind of gave way to to some serious depression in in parts of it um which can also deter creativity so it was it was up and down during during lockdown for me creatively speaking Amy, could you also share a bit about lockdown specifically, how that affected what you do? Um, hi, Amy. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, that was I was I wasn't sure you were talking to me. Sorry, guys. Um, well, I mean, contrary to what Mia was saying, I actually realized that a lot of my creative process happens like in the contrast. Like in the contrast between one thing and another thing. So maybe light and dark, maybe feminine and masculine. But in realizing that like inside those cracks is where my kind of creative expression is, I also realize that it means that it's in contrast to other beings. So myself in contrast to my friends, myself in contrast to people in social environment, people at, you know, um, in clubs, in restaurants. So for me, I was able to remotely do everything. Mm -hmm. except mimic human interactions, you know, recreate that actual thing that happens when people are in the same space together, you know, and uh, it felt like a, it felt a little bit violent, actually, to my creative process at first. It was very abrupt and it took a while to adjust, but when I realized also that it also forced me to unlock other things. So I've always been apprehensive to digital music. Um, I, perform, I perform live, that's my preference. So obviously it wasn't an option, but also the one to express and the one to share was still there. So it has taken, took a bit of time, but also forced me to adapt to what's currently happening. And also have to educate myself because part of the digital um, distribution of music is its own language. So it took for me to actually have to start to understand that part and maybe in a sense, even like level up in terms of reach, you know? So it's been, um, I think like Mia was saying, there have been ebbs and flows within it. And I don't think it was how we wanted it to be, but I do think it's how it had to be, you know? Mm. Interesting. And you, Fabio, did lockdown bring anything specific? Like... Um, lockdown actually fueled a lot of my creativity. Mm. Um, lockdown was forced me to like be alone and forced me to be intimate um, and like socialize virtually. And like, I feel that it allowed me to like speak to myself in a way that I haven't spoken to myself in a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things that lockdown has brought was a response from my mom. Um, I was doing a Pink Balaclava shoot um, and my mom was co-directing one of these shoots. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it was a very weird experience. Mm -hmm. Like at that point, I was, I was like, I, I would expect my mom to be conservative and like, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. But at the point she knew that this was art and she almost inserted herself into the context in which I was creating. Mm -hmm. um, but it, lockdown has also made me very sensitive to people's responses. Um, mm -hmm. As much as it's fueled my creativity, it's like, I'm so, I would, I would even say obsessed to like, be curating people's perception of what they think of mm -hmm. Kabil, my work. Um, and it's also because a lot of my work 
in the beginning of lockdown stemmed to like me and my nude body and like myself in the middle. Um, and at the time, like we're gonna call a spade a spade, fans only was also like on the horizon. And a lot of my work was confused with like fans only content. Um, and at the point I even created with that in mind, like I created with this idea or this lens that you're looking at me in not just in like this context of like body positivity and body politics, that you're looking at me as stimulation. Um, and like, even through that, I use stimulation to convey a message. I use stimulation to, yeah, to like preach my activism. Um, and I think that throws back to this idea of audience, like where am I presenting to? And like part of me becoming so sensitive and like realizing that a lot of my audiences are basically on Instagram and people that I really can't um, almost curate physically my work. So I needed to like also create these captions, mini artist statements, and it became a really like interesting journey for my creativity. Um, thing is just it made me much more sensitive like to perceptions mm. really sensitive yeah yeah i think also it's like i've never put really maybe a few times myself in my work but when i put family in my work it, it just turns into a different <laughs> thing it turns into a very different thing um also because your mother is someone that you don't expect to be having not just alone in your creative space, but also your intimate and like your raw natural form that she saw last, what, 20 years ago? <laughs> so it's, I was also so conscious about how she's actually trying to direct this into what she's wanting. So it became less about my art direction, what I wanted to see on camera. She had fun with it and she was like, no, no, you should try this, you should try this. And also like a couple of responses that I got was like from people that I didn't expect to be understanding, not just nude photography, but understanding, um, contextualizing something, like boxing it away from reality and being like, this is what I'm saying. And a lot of people that got back to me were like, oh, you like mind boggling, triggering. And I'm just like, oh, I was just wanting to disturb you, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. And that was basically my responses and like my experiences during lockdown. Uh, and you were really like, there's a lockdown. Um, uh, lockdown for myself, it was um, quite tough, um, I must say. Um, the only thing that I can say that was positive about it is that I managed to allow myself to be so radical that we started a movement mm. and the movement is called the we see you group where we went and captured the mansion in Kent's Bay mm. uh, in solidarity with what was going what's happening in the world in terms of colonization uh, patriarchy uh, human rights and inequality you know and I think the first three months of lockdown they were like the, the toughest like mm -hmm. when i could just go outside and there were no people at all it was just it was just strange it was in fact like you were somewhere else instead of like in this world and i think because of that it, it allowed me to to push boundaries a bit because Imagine capturing the mansion in Kent's Bay. But yeah, that's art. Yes. 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 Art that's art right there. Exactly. Yeah, but uh, yeah. also in that way, that's what I'm saying. That was the most uh, positive thing I could say about it. We managed to, to, to touch and reach out and sort of put a question mark mm -hmm. to how things, if we were to push it that hard, could mm -hmm. actually change. But then again, it's how much we want it to change. Mm. And obviously change is not going to come to us. Mm. We just have to take it. Mm. Like, I, like I've been saying earlier, we have been educating yeah. for so long. Yeah. We cannot keep educating. Yeah. I mean, like imagine in the next 
15 years, we're still educating. Then mm. honestly, we are not really doing much, but we must just get out there. You know? Like, let's just let those niggas <laughs> see that you are here, you know? Mm -hmm. There's nothing yeah. that you can do about it. They're not gonna change who you are. And push, oh, link it harder, you know? Yeah, sometimes it can be dangerous. I'm not saying like put yourself yeah. <laughs> in that dangerful space because that the one safe thing I liked about Camp Spade was it was actually a very safe space. Like mm -hmm. not everyone could come there and attack you. Mm -hmm. uh, it really became a really amazing safe space where people could heal, where mm -hmm. you could just be who you wanted to be. There was nobody to bother you. And obviously, I would like to see that whole uh, project going forward because, as a queer group, we actually do not have safe spaces. So mm -hmm. We need spaces like that. We need spaces mm -hmm. where we could just go in. You don't have to be anyone but, but you. And yeah, that's hopefully that's a way, there's a way that that we can work out. Yeah. And, you think there's a difference between like activism and a radical act or like? No, I, I don't think there is a difference, but uh, when you do something that extreme, yeah, hard to see it as radical. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, activism, you cannot be also just a normal, I mean, revolution. Okay. So it's not, all radical. Yeah, yeah. Effort, revolution right? is not yeah. like, something we can see on you need to double that thing they need to feel that it's a but then we must take it further because i know we've been talking arts and activism but actually art how art spark revolution yeah, itself yeah, right yeah. also how so, art created war back then um like i'm so like i'm second year and i hate art history hmm. and like it's such a weird kind of compulsory knowledge that we need to have as artists, like art history. Um, and talking about this um, radical form of like protest, I came across this term called creative protest. Um, and it's basically, I actually wrote an essay about the camp um, and it is, And I was trying to understand um, activism and art in combination um, and what that would look like. Um, and basically like creative protest is, is the embodiment of activism and art. And it's just, yeah, like even the, a lot of the fees must fall um, protest um, was basically um, creative protest. Mm. Um, and like the one thing, like if you draw back to fees must fall, the statue, um, the statue in, its, in itself is an embodiment of art. It's because um, statue and sculpture is art. Mm. And the fact that this thing triggered so many feelings um, mm. and it needed to be removed in itself, that is, is it's, it's protest art, um, mm. it's creative protest. Um, yeah, and creative protest has been a, like a very interesting kind of topic in the back of my mind for like a couple of months now. Mm. I mean, Mia, when I, I, when I hear your work, would you say, would you call it creative pro protest or what would you? <laughs> say to that? I mean, it's a novel, so I'm not sure I can call it creative protest. When I think of, of things I've been a part of that I would call creative protest is um, Stripperoki, mm. which I, I know is somewhere on the program as well. Um, and that's such a good example for me. And, and we were a, a collective that that is, like we're no longer doing events, obviously, um, but sex worker positive, um, queer pos positive, body positive space where you can be on a pole, you can express yourself, you have a range of different bodies. Um, you're making a statement about the fact that um, sex, sex work isn't yet decriminalized. Um, and you're also allowing freedom, you know, freedom to, to have fun with it and to, and to celebrate different kinds of bodies in a space. Yeah. That, that simultaneously does it. So that you have these beautiful dances with, with different different backgrounds um, on a stage, performing their art while making a statement and creating a space that hasn't ever been, you know, has never existed before. Because obviously, if you go to a strip club or you go 
you know, wherever you go, sex work in that sense is still very hetero and very male gazy. And so creating and subverting that space um, for me would be such an example of um, that, that intersection between art and activism. Um, mm. More than what I can say a book is because you know, it's a book. <laughs> you wouldn't know exactly how it affects a reader because you can't now look into how this reader has received the work and if it sparked change in them because I don't know you know so I, I'm more reluctant to speak on that um, because reading is such a it's such a personal and immediate space that it's, it's hard to, to classify within that um, mm. that's it but I'm so keen to get into your book, really, like, honestly, I, because I think just any different way of pre representation, because we've been so oppressed, is a, is a revolutionary act, you know, anything. I mean, that... The one thing that I think did come from it, for, from, for me personally, um, was the publication of the book in my own family led to a multi-generational conversation between me, my mother, and my grandmother, wow. where a person who was in the family was discussed openly for the first time in 22 years, you know, which is not, it's not activism in that sense, but it's, it's activism kind of within a family, within your immediate community and environment. Yeah. And so the meaning that takes place there. Um, so, you know, radical acts can can take place in a very inter, interpersonal familial space as well um and so yeah i, I don't know i think those are maybe two examples of, of ways that it, it could be it you know could be imagined like with we see you as well there's so many forms it can take because art and activism can quite seamlessly help each other you know mm -hmm. and it, it does allow for a lot of possibilities and, and um you know change in, in different spaces that you wouldn't even anticipate. Hmm. And Amy, like your work in radicalism, how do you see it? Like, can, do you see it as a radical act itself? What you do? I mean, I do. I mean, I was saying earlier that I think that just maintaining presence as queer bodies in spaces is already an act of, of uh, is already a statement, you know? Your body itself becomes a your body, your body, your body sometimes goes from being something that really makes you a victim to like actually empowering you in nudity, in actual the naked of the truth actually as well. You know, like like um, breaking silences as well. So I also think I've gotten so sometimes, um, particularly with the, with the spoken word, so radical that sometimes it's I forget that I'm saying things in a way that that are gonna shock people. Sometimes I, I, I forget to calculate the own shock value into things because it's become such an intrinsic, yeah, it's become such an intrinsic part of what I do, you know? So, and, and very often if there is a more sensitive way to say something, I'm less likely to say it that way. I'm more likely to, you know, I don't think you can put a, a wick in a, a pile of poop and call it a candle. You know what I'm saying? Some people used to call a pile of poop what it is. And so, I have gotten I've gotten responses where and especially like um Alan S was saying, like that's not very feminine or mm. you know, why do you have to be so rough or, or however it comes? So I take it in my stride, but I do think that I'll be lying to say I'm not radical, but I do think that as radicals, we don't often call ourselves radicals. Even mere like kind of understating how radical a book could be just kind of speaks to how we just it's kind of just normal Wednesday for us, you know. We're not trying to be radical, we're just born this way, I think. Oh, wow, okay. And do you, I mean, I've been asking the questions, but do you have questions for each other or just like sections you want to pick up on if okay. someone said something? So like, I want to draw to like Amy Brown. Um, I, I like the fact that you, that you're not aware about the shock value. Um, Cause it's, it's, like we were talking about like being aware of creating and like recreating for mm -hmm. um and this idea of or like wanting to calculate shock value mean, means that like you you've like you've sugarcoated and watered down yes. like what you want to express um and like i i identify with like that 
not calculating my shock value. Um, and I think that's what makes creating in the way that I do so powerful and also like communicative and like informative in a way that when I get responses, I'm just like, I did not expect this. Mm-hmm. Um, and like more pressingly the fact that you are spitting and that you are like doing this in your own like mother tongue and you're actually saying this is not my mother tongue. Um, and for me, I think that is, yeah, that is a level of agency and like, yeah, that's just powerful. I think that's powerful. Thank you, I appreciate that. I do, um, especially, I mean, with the, with the nudity thing, it's been something I've been thinking about as a feminine body and thinking the way in which like the feminine form gets uh, as like this kind of violent approach to it. And I do think that um, having watched the pink, uh, the pink Bella Clover display, it was yeah. definitely something, I think it was something I needed to see because I think it's, there's enough layers for it to be equally shocking, not intentionally because it is sincerely you, but also really what is needed right now. Mm, okay, thanks. Hello, Nick. You want to add? For me, I don't want to. I don't want to add. But you don't want to. Okay. But no. also, okay. I, I, um, I, I had a question. I had a question for her, but I, th- I believe that I'll ask her when I like. I got to see how work. Like, I'm more interested in seeing your work because I'm mm-hmm. also like, um, I'm from school, so I'm a photographer and a filmmaker. So I'm still stuck in two in one. So mm-hmm. I'm exploring everything. So. I believe that those questions will come <laughs> when yeah. I see her work. Well, like, you need to choose one. Yeah, perhaps. you don't need to, you choose, don't need one. to choose one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can be. You can be whatever you want to be. Wow, guys. Um, Mia, I know we're leaving the last few minutes to you. Um, were you going to? Read something for us, so I took the idea for our last few minutes. Yeah, I think I'm gonna do a quick, a quick reading. I know we don't have much um, longer, so it's gonna be super quick, and then I'll leave a bit of time at the end of it as well because it's, you know, it's, it's not too long. So um, I'm going to read from my chapter two, which is um, a chapter entitled "Trash," which I I feel like has become a bit of a theme for for this <laughs> evening. Um, which is wonderful. Uh, so let's go. Um, it's, it's, it starts out from the voice of this goddess of retribution uh, character. And she says, before we drank in the dark, we used to say bumpies in the sun, eating sippy sherbet and licking twice as nice. Mm-hmm. Yellow chappies and the green bashus. Before they turned up at the club, we cut beats on school desks with bubble gum underneath them. Tamir blared from the subwoofer of a Nissan Sabre. We ran to the faded green electricity box in the park where we played An-An. The orange and black butterflies scattered as we trampled. We caught muscles in tidal pools. It was the era of TLC and older sisters putting butterfly clips in our hair. This was before they called us Eitgerek, before they whistled at us and called us Ochat and pushed us to the kitchen to make potato salad. Every time men would crash, the storm would rage red. Just one single drop of thick uterine blood would plop down onto the, onto the microaggressive nyas. But a full menstrual storm would break the lining of the sky and drown the more vicious and notorious predators because she, in her wisdom, saw it fit to cleanse the trash and, and, and nourish the soil. Um, and then I'm just going to read a, one more paragraph that's right at the end. Um, every bulbul has a bulbul south. Every Rondebosch has an Athlone. Every Maitland has a Kensington. There are two Cape Towns, and that's easy to forget. Maybe the Dukum will lift someday, but for now, if you look closely at Table Mountain and you see the tracks and the stains from where the thick blood poured down its arching slopes. And when you look at the sky and smell metal, you'll know why. Yeah. Wow. So where do we get your book? Yeah, where do we get the book? <laughs> um, 
you could get it at, at, at like exclusive books, Wordsworth, most of the of those mainstream um, retailers. If they don't have it, just ask so that I can get more orders in. But otherwise, um, you can go to mermaid, mermaidfillet.com. There's a website and then I can sign a copy and get it um, hand delivered to you as well. Um, so Thank you so much. And I think we just we have about five minutes. And you know what interested me about what you read now is like, how space, especially like a space like Cape Town, can influence our work. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to have everyone touch on that, you know, where you come from, what kind of effect does that have on what you create? Um, you, um, you can just go like this. <laughs> I like the fact that, like, it sounds like I'm talking to a girl from Mitchell's Plain or, like, I don't know, like, Atari, somewhere that I'm, I, I see you. And like, it's the same with Amy's work. Like when Amy, her creativity is the same. It's like, and I feel that is a very welcoming um, tone or like thing for someone that is gonna be also a person of color. Um, and like that, that rawness that you're creating with is, is that same rawness I, I, I try and create with myself. Um, and like I haven't created from my actual like community where I come, like where I came from. Um, I've done like a few photos there, um, but like this has actually reminded me to like go back, mm -hmm. go scratch deeper. Um, mm -hmm. So basically mm -hmm. like, thank you. And you, uh, okay, so me, because um, I'm not originally from Cape Town mm -hmm. and when I first got here, uh, I thought, okay, where am I? Because uh, Cape Town does have that very uh, European feel about it so much. It looks like you're not in South Africa. And that's what made me to actually start doing work about Cape Town. Because actually, this beautiful place is ours. It is here in our country. We might not be running it, but maybe that's why a lot of people want it because it is so beautiful. So yeah, that was the influence that I thought I'm not sure whereas I am here and this is part of my country. And of course, because there is so much history as well, uh, seeing that I'm doing more of the social justice type of work in terms of we want to have equal skills at the end of the day. And here yeah, it's still so very uh, racist, if you might put it that way, mm -hmm. uh, compared to Jobek and compared to Devon, where I origi originally come from. And uh, definitely hope one day soon we will take over our own space, make it our own Europe if we wanted it to be yeah. Europe. Sure. Yeah. Africa. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, I believe. Um, oh, can you please? Yeah. Like, how do our spaces influence our work? Whether mm. it's Cape Town or our, you know, smaller communities. You know, what kind of role do they play in how we create what we create? Okay. I believe like um, it's because we want to see change. You see, when you want to see change. You gotta put some effort on that. So I believe that um, by us trying to change people's mindsets, I, I heard you when you were saying um, we've been fighting, mm -hmm. but I believe that we should not stop fighting mm -hmm. until yes. the fight is over. If we're not fighting, who's gonna fight for us? <laughs> you see, yeah. so we should I fight. Didn't say stop fighting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying you said, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just I'm just um, highlighting what you said. Yeah. So. For our future generation, we gotta fight for them. Maybe they are the ones that will like get what we're fighting for. Maybe the freedom. We can say the freedom is free because for us, it's a free. Mm. So yeah, yeah, that's why it's can be free. Yeah, it can be. Democracy is a plus. Yeah, mm. must be taken. Yeah, <laughs> really. Mustn't be given. Must be taken. Yeah. Be to die. Um, Amy, how have you Hi guys, so you see, I've lost, I lost some light. Some, yeah, some light. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very like, <laughs> 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 I 
That's so good. <laughs> I do think I do think that um, on what you were saying about remembering to go back, uh, that's so true. But also, I always like um, remind myself that we are influenced by so many things, like outside of ourselves, especially as people of color. Sometimes not always having the whole story of our history. We kind of fill the gaps in with influence. So there's really like there's nothing entirely wrong with like going outside of who you are. Sometimes, as creatives, our language or expression at the bubby, or when we when I when our talk is tricking, is not the same way we express our art. You know, it's some sometimes the rounding of the vowel sound or the you know it does happen. You know, it's part of expression, and I never want to box myself into that. But it's not it's not coincidental that I've been born in the Western Cape, in Cape Town, in this body to those people you know, in the space, you know, so that that I can't refute. So my space is definitely important, but I mean, just feeling safe in my own body, body geography is already such a challenge that I don't, I often like you end up representing people inadvertently. You don't go out wanting to like represent people. You just want to go and express and then people see that, you know. So again, like everything, finding a balance between what you want to say and not being apologetic. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mia, do you wanna? I, you know, it adds such a Cape Town flavor in what you were saying. Does the city, country, certain spaces, do they play a role in what you do? Or how do they affect yeah, what you do? Definitely. So, Cape Town is so segregated. The spatial apartheid in the city is. I mean, we we all we all know what it is. And so I think it's not something we can shy away from. And as I move through life now, I grew up in Belleville South. I now live in the Southern suburbs in a very different space. Mm -hmm. And those differences play in my mind all the time. And you know, it's, it's a simple, it's not far away where you'll, like I'll go visit my friend um, living on living on Clove Street or living on Bantry Bay or, or, or whatever. And it's so it's vastly different from, you know, the spaces that, I've come from and, and also this idea of now as you escalate, you move into different, you move away from those spaces, you move into other spaces, and then what what sense of belonging is lost there? What spends like what responsibility do you have to go back? There's also like, you know, this feeling of almost loss of identity that happens as you, you know, because assimilation is just is just a bitch like that. So it's consistently playing in my mind, and you cannot ever, ever unsee the spatial apartheid of okay. Cape um so yeah that's that's all right <laughs> guys can you just like clap for ourselves thank you. Hey. <laughs> Yo, thank you so much this was such an awesome session i think we honestly just flowed to so many things and um let's check something Oh, Dr. Kering, thank you ever so much, guys, for sharing experiences and looks and looks you adjusted well during lockdown with all those challenges. Thanks so thank much. Um, guys, and this is your yeah, account. Like for me, this was so great meeting you all on a platform like this. And I think I, I just walk away with like new, I just feel like there's so much to reflect on. And thanks so much for sharing. And thanks for all those who came through to share with us. Thank you guys. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. We'll end the session there. Thank you so much. Thanks for hosting us as well, Nadine.